green. Will you be fine, sweet briar or thatch? Flowers several, leaves radical. The head foliate, the mind green. Tendrils from the tear ducts, syllables on the tongue. Stubbled with burrs, dappled with shadows, intention branching to complexity. Will you be bindweed or jack by the hedge? Will you be willow, clover or woad? For a long time now, my writing has deliberately confined itself to one geographical region. The poems are explorations of and responses to the different landscapes of the Northwest Highlands and Islands. This gives me a set of parameters to work with. It provides material for poetry and it gives coherence across a body of work. These are landscapes of great clarity and resilience. They often have a surprising gentleness. All qualities that I want to percolate into the poetry. But this is not where I live. I live on the east coast above Edinburgh. So I'm always at some distance from the landscapes I write about. No doubt this distance sharpens desire. I always want to head out into the highlands. Somehow I feel more relaxed there than anywhere else. I seem to be more responsive and resourceful than anywhere else. It's as if a whole set of cultural accretions had fallen away, or more likely blown away. And this is one sense of the threadbare coat, the title of this new book from Carcanet Press. It's an image of poverty and exposure, as if there could be only the lightest membrane between you and the landscape, some sort of tattered garment between you and experience. These can be quite lonely places until you learn the idiom of the place. Often the poems are little more than a list of affections. If you like something, you might want to say its name over and over, as if to bring it near. Corrie Finn Lochan Lapping of the little waves Breaking of the little waves Spreading of the little waves Idling of the little waves Rippling of the little waves Settling of the little waves Meeting of the little waves Swelling of the little waves Trembling of the little waves, dancing of the little waves, pausing of the little waves, slanting of the little waves, tossing 
of the little waves scribbling of the little waves lilting of the little waves sparkling of the little waves leaping of the little waves drifting of the little waves running of the little waves splashing of the little waves The title of this new book, The Threadbare Code, is borrowed from a traditional Irish fiddle tune. The Threadbare Code is a slow air. Unlike jigs and reels, a slow air is for listening rather than dancing. It's an interval where you can get your breath back, where you are out of the dance for a moment. So it's intrinsically attentive and reflective. For the fiddle players themselves, this is a chance to show off their in interpretation of the melody, which will actually be well known to everybody present. And by implication, that also shows some idea of their particular contribution to the tradition as a whole. I think that the slow air is also where you're most likely to hear what old fiddle players called the lonesome touch. This is something inexplicable but essential to the music. Many of the old players were itinerant musicians. They wandered from village to village and played in pubs and houses. So walking in the landscape was their way of life. It's not too fanciful to think that something of that experience, something of walking in the landscape, something of its spaciousness and undulation might get into the music. If you look at a line of melody, you often see a range of hills. I would like my own poetry to be melodic. I'd like it to have an intricate little music of vowels and consonants but at times also a touch of lonesomeness might be necessary. We tend to think nowadays of the highland landscapes as being lonely and empty, but that's not their natural condition. That's the result of clearance. It's a management decision. In fact, it's a whole history of mismanagement. Although I prefer my poetry to be celebratory, to stand in the sun, it also needs a proper note of lament for the people and the land. The Quiet Island Then we came to a quiet island Where waves dropped quietly on the shore Where streams flowed quietly And waterfalls poured silence We spoke there in whispers 
and a rumour ran through the reeds that quiet was healing, that quiet would heal our wounds. Dawn spread, dusk settled. The interior of the island was quiet. You could lean back into quiet. You could carry it about. The cock didn't crow. The bull didn't bellow. Dogs had lost their bark. The woods were great reserves of quiet. The hills were resting bells. Soon we had had enough of it, but were too polite to say that quiet needs interruption, that events are a melody. Branches were heavy with moss, apples dropped without sound, you could glean the sweet, bruised fruits of quiet. You could spread your bread with honey from the quiet hive. Mountains were wrapped in mist, rocks in wool. Hollows filled with pollen. The days were thistledown. On a morning early, we went down to the sea and pushed the boat out quietly. If you walk regularly in the landscape, then obviously you come across the same things over and over again. And if you write about walking in the landscape, then you will use the names of those things over and over again. This might be one version of the refrain that a word is repeated not only within a poem but across many poems, bringing the whole thing together. If you have a favourite wildflower, you'll be happy to see it again in different places, in different company. And the same is true of words. You may be delighted to come across a word in flourishing again in some new situation. There's a little game that children sometimes play when they're on their own, where they repeat a word over and over again until all the meaning drains out of it, until it becomes just a sound, a nonsense syllable. It might actually be quite a good exercise for poets but this seems to happen because the word is repeated outside of any context. And this is actually the opposite of how poetry functions. Poetry nourishes words in their context. It tries to refresh the language. Perhaps this is the proper ecological concern of poetry. It's not to write about birds and flowers or the quality of the air and water. It is to care for words and their relations. You could ask the question, what impact does language have on the environment? 
can there be a poetry that is not yet another humanism? It might be the responsibility of poets to ask this kind of question. The threadbare coat is my selected poems. And the poems were chosen from all those poems that could comfortably fit into this kind of standard volume of poetry. Not everything I've done works in that way. So I'll finish off with just one example of something that works well away from the page. This is a short film made in collaboration with my friend John Shanky. So I hope you enjoy the film and I hope you enjoy the threadbare code.